Lights Out Chapter 15, and if you happen to, this gets uploaded before 14, it's shorter. So I'm reading it so I can get it on the thing and then delete it. Gunny showed up at the house at 7.30. Mark had already run and was knocking out the rest of his PT when he heard the knock on the door. Hey, Gunny, I wasn't expecting you till 8 o'clock. Did you have any trouble finding the place? Twasn't no trouble at all, karate man. I just don't know for sure how long it would take to get here, so I left early. Let me see if Jim's up. I want to take a quick shower, and then we can get started. Mark finished his shower, got dressed, and was back outside with Jim and Gunny in less than five minutes. They got into the Jeep to save the wear and tear on Gunny's bad knees. John waved them down as they passed his house. I decided maybe I'd better go with you all, he said as he climbed into the Jeep. Mark introduced the two Marines to each other. The two men talked a little and found they'd served on some of the same bases, although at different times and in different capacities. Gunny had always been a combat Marine, and John had spent his four-year enlistment in supply. As they drove toward the gate, Gunny told them that the first thing they needed to work on was some training from the guards. Haley said, I just drove up here and told them boys I had me an appointment with the karate men. They just waved me through, and they didn't know me from Adam. They didn't even get out of the chairs they had on the shady side of the sign. I know I'm just a broken down old man, but no stranger should get in without someone who knows him comes to the gate and gets him. Excuse me, Sergeant Pickwell, but we don't have a gate, John pointed out. Then you damn well better get one. I could have just run them boys over sitting in them lawn chairs like they was on a picnic or something. By the time they would have figured out they was in deep shit, I'd have been in and they'd have been dead. Pickett should be seen where they can should be where they can see threats from all directions, not sitting on their asses in the sage shooting his shit. You should have known that, Marine, just from basic training. But these men aren't Marines, John said in a voice bordering on whining. Mark could see that John was getting a little ruffled by Gunny's candor. He suggested they look at everything and then sit down and talk about what they could do to fortify their defenses. They spent the next hour driving around the subdivision and up and down the county road each way for a mile or so. Gunny asked several questions about how many people lived in the subdivision and how many houses there were. John knew there were 62 lots and 47 houses, but no one knew exactly how many people were living or or staying in the neighborhood. When Gunny had seen the whole subdivision, he told Mark to head back to the house. He asked for some paper and a pencil. Then the men sat down at the picnic table. Gunny started drawing a map of the area as he spoke. Mark was amazed at the accuracy. Most of your threats will come from the road, and that's where I would concentrate my efforts first. You have one lane into the subdivision and one out, with the Silver Hills sign between them. I'd tear the sign down so that it don't obstruct the guard's view in either way. Then I'd barricade off one of the lanes and put a badass gate across the other, kind of like the one you told me about at the ranch, Gunny said, nodding at Mark. I'd dig a good foxhole about 30, maybe 40 yards from the gate for the guards. Close enough to be able to talk to someone, but not so close that they could get the jump on you. Then, if and someone needs to be let in, one guard opens the gate while the other covers him. The subdivision is about 600 yards wide, and the main road through it runs pert right up the middle of it. Pert much right up the middle of it. There's a 50 or 60 yard buffer between the county road and the closest properties. That contains the ditch, the front fence, and some then some empty field. The perimeter is fenced by a good five-strand barbed wire on the back and the sides, but the front only has that little decorative wood fence on this side of the ditch. I'd dig out the ditch so it has a four-foot vertical wall on this side. That'll keep anything on wheels from coming, being able to just drive through the ditch and into the field. I'd also try to find me some wire and put barbed wire fence across the front about ten feet this side of the little fence, too. That'll slow down anybody trying to get in on foot. Then you should dig two more foxholes, one on each side of the road, half to two-thirds of the way to the side fences. If someone attacks from the front, you can get some men in those holes and have some overlapping fields of fire. You might even want to put two on each side. You also need to come up with some kind of comm system for the guards to get reinforcements if they need them. That should pretty much cover the front. Now for the sides and back. To guard them, effect... You mean we need to guard the sides and back too, John asked. Yes, sir, Gunny said flatly. The east side is pretty easy because it's all pasture. Anyone trying to get across it is going to be easy to see. Most of the west side is farmland. As long as the crops aren't tall, that'll be easy too. But if it gets planted in corn or something, it'll be hard to see anyone till they're right on the fence. The back and some of the west are going to be a real bear. Most of that is brush, and anyone with any kind of woodcraft is 
at all is going to be able to get over the fence before you can stop them. Fortunately, it's also the least likely place for neophytes to try to bust in or attack from. But you get any shadow warrior types, that's where they'll come from. And they're going to ruin your day if you're not ready. We need to look at the back and side some more and figure out exactly how we want to guard and defend them. For now, I would get started on the front, and when that's finished, we'll get on the sides and then the back. The last thing I would work on is an observation post to see people coming up and down the road. Don't you think that's kind of overkill, John asked? Depends on how much your ass is worth to me, to you. Karate man asked me to tell you what I think, and that's what I think. Whether you do it or not is up to you. John looked like he'd just been bitten into a turd. He had just bitten into a turd. <laughs> I've got to go. We'll talk this over later, he said to Mark as he walked out. Wait up, John. I'll walk with you, Mark said. Thanks, Gunny. Lisa and Jess are fixing lunch. We'd be pleased if you'd stay and eat with us, Mark offered. Thanks, karate man. Don't mind if I do. Now, where's my girls, Jimbo? The four men got up from the table. Jim and Gunny went to find the twins, and Mark walked with John back to his house. <coughs> I don't think we need to do all that stuff, John said. Nobody's going to try to attack us in force like that or try to break in the back, sneak in the back. It's just a waste of resources and manpower. That may be, John, but I think we should consider it. We don't know what is going to happen, and wouldn't it be better to be safe than sorry? Maybe, but I just don't think it's necessary, John said emphatically. When they reached John's house, he and Mark spoke for a few more minutes. John reluctantly promised to think about what Gunny had suggested. As Mark walked home, he found it curious that John had first wanted to put guards at the entranceway, and he was opposed to it. Now the roles had effectively reversed. When he got home, lunch was on the table. Gunny sat down, and one twin sat on each side of him. Mark imagined that the old Marine had never looked happier. During lunch, they discussed the events of the last week. Gunny wasn't bashful about adding his two cents worth. When he heard about Mark's encounter at Kroger, he really laid it on thick, teasing Mark about making that poor little defenseless boy piss his pants. Everyone else joined in the fun. Mark was used, getting used to it. When the topic turned back to the serious side, everyone agreed that so much had happened that it seemed more like a month than a week since the burst. When they were almost done with lunch, Mrs. Peterson dropped by. Hi, Mrs. Peterson. How are you? Just the first to see her said, I'm doing fine. I was just wondering if I could get some ice to chill some of the things I fixed for the party, she answered. Sure, how much do you need? I think ten pounds would be enough. A lot of the trays were already frozen last night, so I emptied them into some plastic shopping bags and refilled them. David, would you go get one of the bags and bring it out to Mrs. Peterson? Yes, sir, David answered his dad. Mrs. Peterson, I'd like to introduce you to my neighbor. This is Gunnery Sergeant Marcus Pickwell, Jim said, and then looked at Gunny. This is Mark and Jess's neighbor, Abigail Peterson. Gunny stood up and walked over to Mrs. Peterson. He shook her outstretched hand. Everyone just calls me Gunny. It's a pleasure to meet you, ma'am. The pleasure is all mine, Marcus. Mrs. Peterson smiled and then spoke again. Marcus, would you help me with this ice? Yes, ma'am. Gunny snapped out his answer and then smiled back. Everyone just stared in disbelief as Mrs. Peterson walked back toward her house with Gunny in tow, carrying the ice. When they were safely out of earshot, Jim cracked up. The others followed suit. Did you see the way he snapped too, Jim said, barely able to catch his breath. I thought he was going to salute when he said, yes, ma'am. Did you hear the way she called him Marcus after she, he said to call him Gunny? Lisa asked. Gunny was gone for better part of an hour. When he came back, Mark and Jim were readjusting the new carburetor on Jim's truck. He had a big smile on his face, bigger than the one Mark had noticed at lunch, and he seemed in a hurry to leave. What's your hurry, Gunny? You sure took your time over to Abigail's, Mark said with a big grin seeking revenge for the ribbing he'd gotten earlier. We was just talking. Talking, huh? Jim jumped on ban Mark's bandwagon this time. Is that what they used to call it? Boy, you watch the tone you take with me, Gunny was using his best drill instructor's voice, or I'll stick my foot so up, far up your ass that the next time you go to the doctor, he'll ask you how you got them boot tracks on your tonsils. Okay, Gunny, we was just teasing. Why don't you stay for dinner, Mark asked. Abby invited me to the dance tonight. I figured you boys could do with some watching to make sure you don't get out of hand. I'm going home to get cleaned up and I'll be back, Gunny explained. I guess we could use a chaperone, Jim said. Chaperone hell, what you two boys need is a warden. But until we can find one, I guess I'll just have to do the best I can, he said as he climbed up into his truck. I'll be back before dark. All right, Gunny, we'll see you then, Jim said. Everyone ate dinner and then got ready for the dance. After the president's speech, they all walked down to John's. Mark had all of the ice in a big cooler and he, that he'd put in the wagon. 
Even though the dance wasn't supposed to start until dark, the festivities had already begun. Music was playing and everyone was visiting. Mark noticed that almost everyone was smiling for a change. This is a good idea, he thought. For the second time today, he found himself on the other side of the fence from where he started out. <clears throat> Ironic, he mumbled to himself. Mark pulled the wagon over by the punch bowl and just set down a big plate of cookies, chocolate chip cookies on the table that was already half full of cupcakes, brownies, and other treats. Many people had brought lawn chairs to sit in, and Mark asked Jim to go back to the house with him to bring some for the two families. When they got, got back, the dance was in full swing. Gunny had arrived and was talking with Mrs. Peterson, and she was introducing him to some of the neighbors. A George Strait song started playing. Hey, cowboy, want to dance? Jess asked her husband. Sorry, ma'am, but I'm married to a mean old hag who might just castrate me if she found me dancing with a pretty young filly like you. Jess punched him in the arm. Get your sorry ass out here and dance with me, you bum. Oh, baby, I love it when you talk dirty to me, Mark said as he led Jess out to the street turned dance floor. The dance was a huge success. Everyone got to know each other a little bit better. Mark spent some time with the neighbors he'd previously only known as names and faces. He also filled in some of the men on Gunny's suggestions <clears throat> on security. Some thought they should implement them as soon as possible, and others, like John, thought they were unnecessary. He talked with Professor Petrie for quite a long time. He'd also changed his position on security and thought Gunny's proposal was a good idea. Security wasn't all they talked about. Ted Petrie was in charge of the history department at the local junior college, and he and Mark discussed at length the growth in power and size of the federal government since the Civil War. They also spent a little time talking about how much Samantha was dancing with Ted's son, Alex. After a while, Jess came back over and made him dance with her some more. In fact, no one escaped having to dance. David was forced to dance with the twins some, and even Gunny, protesting that his knee hurt, had to take a couple turns around the floor with Abby. At about 10 o'clock, the dance started winding down, and by 10.30, everyone had headed home. As the two families walked toward their house, they noticed a cool breeze out of the north. Must be another cool front coming in, Jim observed. It sure won't hurt my feelings any, Mark added. Did Gunny leave in time for curfew? Yes, but he didn't look too happy having to leave the party before it was over. It kind of reminded me of Cinderella, but with combat boots instead of glass slippers. Everybody laughed. When they were almost to the house, David asked a question. Dad, do you think it's good the power went out? No, some do you. Do you? In some ways, I know a lot of people have died, and I know that some people don't have a lot of food. But if it hadn't happened, we wouldn't have gotten to know the neighbors like we have. I see your point. I guess there's always some good that comes out of everything. It shouldn't take something like the burst to make us get to know the people who live around us, but for some reason it did. Hopefully we'll learn from this. If the lights don't come back on soon, we may learn a lot of things. <laughs>